The Book of Genesis. If you've been listening to my podcast, then you know we've been talking about the rapture and the way this age will come to a close. What we're going to do today is we're going to go back to the beginning and we're going to try to make sense of the creation account written in the book of Genesis. If you've ever read the first few chapters of Genesis, you've probably scratched your head and gone, wow, am I really supposed to believe this? Is this accurate scientifically? Should I take this literally? I mean, we've got talking snakes. We've got light before the fourth day when the sun was created. You know, how do we make sense of all of this? Because you're going to run into the skeptic and the atheist who says, see, there's no way that's God's word. There's no way that's scientifically accurate. So the Bible, we're just going to throw it all out. So how are we going to respond to that? Do we know what to say? Do we even know what we're reading? So that's what we're going to talk about today, because you don't have to be scared and always back on your heels trying to defend God's Word. Yes, you should defend God's Word. That's what apologetics is. But you need to educate that person and say, well, you need to read Genesis in the context in which it was written. It is ancient Near East cosmology, not 21st century cosmology. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the creation account, but we're going to examine it in its proper context. Namely, in the context of other ancient Near East creation myths, we need to get inside the head of people who lived in that time period. What was their worldview? What was their cosmology? How did they understand the origin of the universe? What kind of science did they have? See, when you start inserting Newtonian physics and all this modern stuff, you're butchering the text and you're making it say things that it doesn't say. So anytime you approach Scripture, you need to ask a few questions. Who wrote this? To whom was it written? When was it written? How did the people of that time view their world? What was going on politically at the time of the writing? What genre of literature are you reading, like poetry, narrative, prophecy? If you dive into a text headfirst without considering all of the above, you are diving into shallow water and you will get hurt you will end up doing eisegesis instead of exegesis. See, eisegesis is where you insert your own ideas into the text to make it fit comfortably into your own preconceived ideas. No, what we want is to form our ideas to the text through exegesis or pulling out of the text what is actually there. So when it comes to the first few chapters of Genesis, I have been guilty of inserting 21st century science into the text to try to make sense of it all. By doing this, I robbed the text of its intended meaning and missed the point entirely of what Moses was trying to communicate. I had good intentions because I thought I was defending God's Word against critics. But the critics were also interpreting the text incorrectly, so we all started on the wrong footing. When you read the creation narrative in Genesis, you need to get inside the mind of Moses, the author, and you need to insert yourself into the mind of someone from the ancient Near East. How did the people of that time view their world? What was their cosmology or their ideas about the origin of the universe? When you understand that Genesis was written in the historical context of ancient Near East cosmology, it makes interpreting the text a lot easier. It's when you read the creation account with a Western 21st century mindset that you run into problems. So what we need to do is understand the culture from which this text arose. And the best way to understand a culture that is long gone is to read literature from that time period. This will give us a peek into their world and how they understood reality. Luckily, we don't have to grope around in the dark. The creation myths of other ancient Near East cultures, such as the Sumerians, Egyptians, and Babylonians, have been discovered within the last 150 years or so. The Enuma Elish, for example, which is the Babylonian creation myth, was discovered in 1849. It was discovered by Austin Henry Layard. But it was discoveries like this that helped us understand the worldview of the ancient Near East people. And this is important because Moses was writing at the same time period and shared their worldview. Now, he changed it quite a bit when we compare the Genesis account with these other creation myths, there are similarities, but there are very big differences as well. 
but it's understanding it in its historical context that helps us get a better grasp of what Moses was trying to communicate. Now, before we get too much into this, I want you to think about something. Of all of the great civilizations from the ancient Near East, only one God survived, and that's the God of the Hebrews. If you think about the Hebrew people compared to the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the other civilizations, they really didn't build a great big civilization like they did. Yeah, sure, they conquered some of their neighbors, but they didn't really build something that significant. But the God of Israel, isn't it amazing that out of this obscure little tribe, the tribal deity Yahweh is the only one still standing? And this is rare in the history of the world, because in that day, when nations were conquered, they usually abandoned their gods to worship the gods of their conquerors. But this is not the case with Israel. They never abandoned their God. They never stopped worshiping their God. And it's amazing that Israel never let their neighbors influence their ideas of God. As a matter of fact, they radically departed from their neighbors and their concept of God. And they came up with something unheard of in that day, which was monotheism, the worship of one God. All the other cultures around them were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods, but not the Hebrews. They believed in one supreme God who was transcendent over nature. So the Hebrew concept of God did not come from the other cultures of that time or evolve out of those cultures. No, it was an alien concept. It came from an alien source, and that source was God, the one true God. So we want to know how the people of the ancient Near East thought. In the ancient world, people believed the seed of intelligence or your emotions and personhood were in the internal organs, like the heart or the liver, kidneys, and intestines. They thought that your heart was where you thought. And it's easy to see how they would think this because, you know, your heart responds to your emotion. When you get scared or excited, your heart races. So it's easy to see how they would connect their heart with thinking. But what you need to know is God did not correct their thinking. God was not always in the business of correcting everybody's science. He communicated with them on their level, and he even used that concept. And he said things like, I think in my heart. Of course God knew the heart had nothing to do with your thinking. But why did he need to correct their physiology when he's just trying to communicate with them. All right, so when you read Genesis and you go, well, there's no way this can be scientifically accurate. It doesn't have to be. That is not at all what the message was. God was not interested in correcting their cosmology and their science. And if he did correct it, what science was he going to go with? Was he going to go with Newtonian physics? Was he going to introduce Einstein's theories? Was God going to talk about string theory and quantum physics? I mean, 500 years from now, if Jesus tarries, the science then is going to make the science now look primitive. So what science was God going to introduce to the ancient Hebrews? That was not the point. The point of the text is to say, this God is in control. Let me introduce you to the God, Yahweh. Not, let me explain how God created everything scientifically. Can you imagine how Moses and the ancient Hebrews would have responded if God got into modern-day science? They would have been confused. They would have been lost. So Genesis 1, the creation account, is ancient cosmology. Now, what is cosmology? It is the science of the origin and development of the universe or an account or theory of the origin of the universe. So when the ancients looked up to the sky and they saw blue, they concluded that there must be water above the sky. They had no idea about atoms and molecules and the light spectrum and how the blue part of the spectrum gets scattered in the atmosphere. They didn't know that. And God didn't feel the need to go into details and explain that to them. So when they looked up there and they saw that blue sky, they thought it was water, but they also believed that they were protected 
and there was a separation between them and the water by a solid dome. They believed that the sky was a solid dome. They also believed that the earth was a flat disk floating on water, and underneath was the underworld, and that there were monsters, there were big sea creatures under there. Now here's a very important point you need to know when it comes to ancient cosmology. Ancient cosmology is function-oriented. Okay, so what did it mean for something to exist back then? Did it exist because it had material properties? No. It existed by virtue of its functional properties. So, for example, the sun does not exist just as a ball of hydrogen gas and nuclear fusion. The sun exists to give light to the earth and humans, and that's what was important to the ancient mind. Not what is it made of and how does it function scientifically. No, their question was, what is that thing for and how does it benefit me? So something can be manufactured materially, but it still does not exist if it doesn't have a function. All right, that's the way the ancient mind thought. This is what Genesis 1 is all about. God is not creating or bringing into existence matter. You've got to remember that. Okay? So God is taking something that is already there, and he's establishing roles and functions so it can benefit God or humans. In the ancient world, what mattered and what made something exist was the way the parts of the cosmos functioned, not their material properties. They didn't care about atoms. They didn't care about quarks. They didn't know about that stuff. What they cared about was, how does something function and why? Now, they understood material properties, but that wasn't the main concern. So in all the ancient Near East creation texts, Nothing material is ever made. Think about that. So many times we approach Genesis 1 and we act like this is the creation of the universe. And that is not at all what is being said. And the reason nothing material is ever made in these ancient Near East texts is because their worldview saw gods making the elements and cosmos operational. See, creation was taking non-functional chaos and bringing order. The ancient world viewed the cosmos more like a company or a kingdom, not a machine that is run by someone. So let's get into Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. Now, it's the beginning of the seven-day period, not the beginning of time. See, I used to believe that this was in the beginning of time, at the Big Bang. No, it's at the beginning of this story. Verse 1 is an introduction to the rest of the passage. And get this now, there is no gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. I used to teach that. I used to believe that. And the reason I did this is because I was trying to make Genesis fit modern science. You know, the earth is billions of years old and there were dinosaurs. So if we put a gap between the first two verses, that gives us enough time for all of this to take place. But is that what the text says? That's what's important. What does the text say, not what do we want it to say? So when you read Genesis 1-1, it does not say, in the beginning, at the Big Bang. No, here's a proposed translation. In the initial period, God created by assigning functions throughout the heavens and earth, and this is how he did it. And then the rest of the passage explains this opening statement. So it's not, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became formless and empty because Satan rebelled, and there were dinosaurs, and we need the passage to say this because the earth is billions of years old, and skeptics always point to this, and we need to defend it. So let's make the text say something it doesn't say. No, that's not how we interpret Scripture. So the Hebrew word for created is bara. Now we want to know, what did this word mean to the ancient Hebrews? What we think in a 21st century Western world cannot be imposed on the word. Existence is not defined in material terms, remember. Remember, they cared about function. So to create in Genesis 1 is to create a functional activity, not create something from nothing. Bara can also only be divine activity, not human activity. Humans never bara anything, only gods. 
Bara is never used in the context of materials being created. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't believe that God created matter. Of course, they didn't call it matter. It was just understood in their worldview that God's created everything. And the Bible even says in Colossians 1, 16 and 17, in Hebrews eleven three, 3, that God created everything, visible and invisible. But the question here in Genesis is not about that, okay? So we cannot impose that idea on the text if we want to be true to the text. So when you read the word bara or created, you might want to think of the word design. The closest word in the English is perhaps the word design. Because remember, God is taking something that is already there and designing it, making it function, not creating something out of nothing, which is how we've traditionally interpreted the word bara. See, in the ancient Near East mind, the gods who could assign functions and destinies were exercising the greatest amount of power. Not can they create something out of nothing. No, could the god take chaos and turn it into order? That was what was important. Now let's go to verse 2, where it says, And the earth was without form and void. Tohu vavohu. This means formless and empty or unproductive. The earth is there. This is not the creation of the earth, but the earth is not yet functioning in an ordered system. In the ancient world, function was not the result of material properties, remember, but the result of purpose. So when the author mentions a dark, formless, empty earth, he was borrowing from other cultures to communicate truth about God that the ancient Israelites would have understood. In the mythology of the other ancient Near East cultures, the forces of chaos, which are often characterized by darkness and the raging seas, are controlled by deities. In the ancient Near East, they were not asking metaphysical questions about something existing or not existing. So Genesis 1-2 is not talking about something not existing. It's concerned with order instead of chaos. The author was placing the Hebrew God in a place of absolute power by showing how this God controls chaos better than the gods of the other religions. The author of Genesis is also careful to not personify the elements of chaos like the creation myths of the Babylonians or Egyptians. See, Moses radically departed from these other cultures. So you can't say that Moses was stealing or borrowing from these other cultures. No, he was very careful not to make these elements gods. He was talking about one God, the one true God. Now, where it says that darkness was over the surface of the deep, it's important to note here that Moses does not personify the darkness here. Again, the other cultures, they did. They made this darkness out to be a god. In the Babylonian worldview, Tiamat was the goddess of the primordial deep mentioned in the Enuma Elish, which is the Babylonian creation account. Tiamat is the Tahom here of the Hebrew Bible. Okay? Moses does not make Tahom or the deep a god like the Babylonians do. Genesis is different because there is no evil in this dark chaos. God is not at war with another god here. God simply hasn't assigned order and functions yet. Now, you've got to consider something. Moses was a prince of Egypt. He was very educated. He studied Egyptian cosmology. He studied Egyptian religion. So it is amazing that Moses changed his concept of God. And where did he get these ideas? It would have been very easy for him to just steal and borrow from the Egyptian culture he was raised in. But that's not what he did. He must have gotten this information from somewhere. And the only thing that makes sense is God must have told him. God must have revealed himself to Moses. This is where Moses got all these different ideas about God. Now let's talk about the part where it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. Now if you're a Christian, you have traditionally interpreted this to mean the person of the Holy Spirit. That's what we all grew up hearing. That's what we were all taught. But let me ask you this question. Is that what Moses was thinking about when he wrote this? And is that how the ancient Israelites would have interpreted it? You must understand that God revealed himself progressively. It is doubtful that God was introducing a Trinitarian concept 
to the people here. You've got to remember the Israelites were living right in the middle of a polytheistic culture. They were immersed in polytheism. For God to introduce the person of the Holy Spirit here in a polytheistic culture would have been confusing to the Israelites. I mean, they were already struggling with their monotheism, and they did go back and forth. They would rebel against God, and then they would worship many gods. They would worship false gods, and then God would have to discipline them, and then they would come running back. And we read about this cycle throughout the Old Testament. But the point is, Moses probably did not have the person of the Holy Spirit in mind here when he wrote this, and the Israelites would not have understood it that way. They would have understood spirit to mean the power of God or like the hand of God, the activity of God, but not the person of the Holy Spirit, which was revealed later in Scripture. So here's an interesting translation by John Walton from his commentary on the book of Genesis. And here's what he proposes for Genesis 1-2. The earth was non-functional, primordial watery darkness prevailed, and a supernatural wind that was permeated with the power of God circulated over the surface of the waters. And I actually like that because I think that's probably closer to what Moses had in mind and the ancient Israelites. Okay, moving along to verse 3, where God said, Let there be light. Now, light in the ancient Near East is never thought to be a material object. Light to them was a condition or a state like goodness. If material properties are in view here, it doesn't make much sense to say that God separated the light and darkness. How do you separate them? Here's a possible translation. Let there be a period of light, and he called this light day. So this is not God creating electromagnetism or photons of light. This is God establishing the day-night cycle. Let there be a period of day, of light. And we say that to this day. It's the daylight hours, meaning the time the sun is up or where there's light. So what we have here is the creation of time, which is a function, not physical light. All right, physical light had been around for billions of years at this point. But God came upon this rocky planet, this watery planet, and he said, all right, there's going to be a period of day and a period of night, and you're going to rotate on your axis like this, and it was so. But this is not electromagnetism. This is not the release of his glory. This is not the first ray of light, okay? This is not the very beginning of time like the Big Bang. This is God establishing the function of the day and night cycle. Okay, so let's move on to verse 6. And God said, let there be an expanse, or canopy, in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Now remember we talked about the ancients, when they looked up and they saw the blue sky, they assumed that there was a solid dome keeping water from hitting the earth. That's where they thought rain came from. So when the Bible says the windows of heaven, they were being literal. They really believed that there were like windows or doors that were opened to allow the water to come down. And it was actually up to about 200 AD that all people thought the sky was a solid dome. So for us to call this an atmosphere is to insert a modern idea that the ancient Israelites would not have been thinking about. Okay, so we can't just insert 21st century science into this and say, well, that must mean the atmosphere. No, that's not at all what Moses was talking about. He was talking about a dome that was separating the waters from the waters. Let's just interpret it at face value. And instead of getting all bent out of shape because it's incorrect science, we need to remember we're talking about ancient cosmology here. And it wasn't God's intention to teach everybody about science. God's intention was to get people saved. We know that this is what Moses meant because, according to Akkadian literature, they make the levels of heaven solid stones. In Mesopotamian thought, 
The stars were engraved on the jasper surface of the middle heavens, and the entire surface moved. So setting heavenly bodies in a solid background was common in the ancient Near East. So it's likely that Moses understood there to be a solid dome around the earth and that there was water over it. Now, again, that's not correct science, but does that mean that we have to throw God's word out because Moses got it wrong scientifically? Again, what kind of science was God going to introduce to these people? It would not have done any good for God to say, well, let me correct you here. There is no solid dome, blah, blah. That would have just confused the people. And God knew that people would discover things through science. So the message of the Bible is salvation, not science. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater just because Moses didn't write about correct science. And don't think that just because God didn't correct Moses' science, that you can't meet God or understand God or know about God in this book. Don't get confused and think that everything has to be scientifically accurate here in order for this to be inspired. The only book in the world that you need to meet God is the Holy Bible. And Moses' account of creation does not diminish that in any way, just because it's not accurate scientifically according to our modern-day science. But 500, 600 years from now, who knows what we're going to believe about the universe? So we need to be careful and not judge and say, well, because of this primitive language, there's no way God can be behind any of this. Well, when you understand the culture of the time and the way they thought, and when you understand the message of the Bible, you don't get confused. You don't have a problem. When you understand that these were traditions and stories passed down generation after generation, that this was the story of the Hebrew people, you don't get all bent out of shape. So what if it's not scientifically accurate? That doesn't mean that you can't meet God and know about God in the Bible. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for today. We will continue our exploration through the book of Genesis in our next video. So I'll see you there. God bless.